It's a huge privilege and honour to be able to come and speak with you today, as it has been for me for the last few weeks while I've been in Singapore as the Nian Kongsi Professor at RSIS. I've had a wonderful time. I've had an opportunity to meet and talk with students. I've been at a magnificent conference organised by SENS earlier this week. I've given talks. I've met some of the interesting thinkers of Singapore and have eaten an enormous amount of food. So I have had a wonderful time. And now it comes to the moment where I give you this lecture. And what I want to do in this lecture is to talk about the far right in a global sense. Now, most of the examples that I'm going to give to you come from the West because that is where my research is focused. But what I want to suggest to you is that there are a number of the themes that I will raise which are applicable more globally. We see today in the category of far right many different types of organization. We see organizations that are motivated by religion, by nationality, by race, ethnicity, by ideology. We see these connected together by the idea that what is at stake is that an exclusive identity is threatened. They believe that they are threatened by something else, some other identity or identities. And they believe that this threat is so profound that it risks their whole and entire existence. It is an existential threat. It's therefore, for them, not part of regular politics. It's therefore perfectly acceptable for the ends to justify the means, because the ends are fundamentally those of survival. That is what they believe. Now, these uh, ideas about exclusive interest, these mo movements of the far right, and the violence that goes with them, can be found in many parts of Asia as well as other parts of the world. We think about just events during 2013. In Japan, for example, we see the activities of the Zatu Kukai, an organization in Tokyo that campaigns, sometimes violently, against Koreans who live in the area of Shin Okubu. In July, there were protests, there were acts of violence, there were hate speeches. Two weeks ago, Angela Merkel has warned against the rise of the far right around the world, but particularly she spoke of her shame as Chancellor of Germany having to order the German police to act to defend Jewish institutions against attack and desecration. In Burma this year, we have seen violence against Muslims in Arakan. In Sri Lanka, the BBS movement, the Buddhist power force, has also engaged in anti-Muslim activity. Even in Mongolia, you will find groups who are motivated by these far-right ideas. The Daya Mongol, for example, a nationalist movement with Nazi imagery, engages in ways of, as they would see it, saving the Mongol nation against being swept away by the Chinese. They glory in one video on YouTube which shows a Mongol woman having her head shaved as an act of humiliation because her husband was Chinese. Some of these ideas also, you might say, apply amongst some elements of Islamism. Far-right ideas and attitudes certainly do exist amongst some Islamic and Islamist movements. And even, you know, in New Zealand, you can find examples of this sort of exclusivist far-right movement, the right-wing resistance movement, which started in Christchurch in New Zealand, is small, but is active online, gathers together in meetings, rallies against immigration, and just a few days ago, they were proud to launch their latest range of merchandise. Because merchandise is a very important element of the global far right. What I would like to do in this presentation is to talk about some of these themes through some examples of the West's far right movements. And what I want to do to begin with is to talk a bit about the traditional, the Cold War far right. What was it that motivated the organizations during this period? Because my key message is that all that has now become a history lesson. That the power of globalization is such that these organizations now operate in really radically different ways. 
So I'll talk a bit about the Cold War, I'll talk a bit about the transformation through globalization, and then I'll talk about these characteristics, as I see them, of contemporary far-right identities and ideas with some Western examples, but I think, I hope you will see them as more generally applicable. So if we just touch on the um, West far-right in the Cold War, this was a very structured world. These organizations had a leader. The leader was absolutely key. The leader was the person who decided what kind of ideology, what counted as ideology. These were not intellectual movements. These were movements where you learned the particular phrases, the particular ideas that were important to the movement. They were structured in the West in three particular strands, nationalist, Christian fundamentalist, neo-Nazi. And they were structured in this way to create rigid boundaries between the strands and also rigid boundaries within the strands. One organization would often find its strongest rival would be a sister organization. Now, some of these organizations, if you look at the nationalists, for example, had political elements to them as well. These political elements were ways in which some of these ideas in an era before the internet could be more widely shared amongst the target populations. Having a political party was much more important before globalization than during globalization. It was a means of sharing ideas and attitudes. These sorts of organizations that I'm talking about now, uh, these parties, they all shared similar sorts of ideas, hostility to communism, opposition to immigration, a social conservatism. They also had violent fringes. In fact, some of them had a violent core as well. The British National Front, for example, was essentially a violent revolutionary organization with a thin veneer of a political structure. Some of these parties were very successful. Not so successful that they could win at democratic elections, but they could sustain a significant minority of support which would give them some political representation, which would give them, therefore, the platforms to share their ideas beyond geographical core areas into wider, uh, wider communities. They were minority, they were established, they had some strong supporters, and they found echoes in their views and ideas across the West. Now there were, of course, quite important cultural differences between the way in which European and American organizations on the far right were structured and how they came about. These European organizations that I've just been talking about were largely products of societies struggling to come to terms with post-war reconstruction, with post-colonialism, and the new role for Europe in the world. In the United States, for example, uh, uh, an organization such as the Citizens Council of America had much deeper roots. A lot of these roots, of course, go back into segregation, indeed, sometimes even back into the days of slavery. And you'll see, I think, in some of these organizations, therefore, um, a greater consistency of message. That historical period of time had allowed them to be more consistent in the way in which they expressed their message. But what connected them together was this sense of threat, that they were profoundly and deeply threatened. Not marginally threatened. These weren't tactical skirmishes. They were involved, and today they still believe this, they are involved in an existential struggle. Threatened from without by the USSR, threatened from within by all sorts of ideologies, ideas, and social movements with which they disagreed. And they did not mind how they would show their position in order to try to generate some support. So here is an image of Martin Luther King at, it is said, from a uh, um, Citizens Council of America poster, a communist meeting. Of course, it's not a communist party meeting at all. It's simply a, a labor grouping meeting. But they would take an image, they would utilize it in a particular way in order to get a, an extreme message across. Now, Christian fundamentalist movements exist now in many parts of the world. They are as we know now, particularly powerful in some parts of Africa. But particularly within the United States, a lot of these organizations and, and ideas originated. The organizational forms often originated. And perhaps slightly in contrast to the other strands, the nationalist strand and the neo-Nazi strand, more time effort was given to thinking about what were the ideas underlying 
their approach. Because, of course, if you hold that you are a Christian, but you also hold that every other Christian church is in some ways wrong, you really have to find a way of justifying why you can hold that position. It would not be terribly difficult to find yourself uh, in a minority of one if you did not have some standard stock answers to describe why the theology of mainstream Christian churches was wrong. Wrong for a reason. Not just wrong by mistake, but wrong for a reason. Wrong because the interests of the white race, as many of these organizations would put forward, were being undermined by other interests. Some of these organizations would believe that literally the white race is God's chosen people. For the white race, therefore, to have any kind of engagement with other races was to undo God's work. You do not need to have very much Christian theology to start pulling these sorts of ideas together. So it's not intellectual in the sense that you could imagine people sitting down and having a debate, having read several learned texts to find out which is the best way forward. But it was in the sense of having answers, stock answers, to describe why it was that they were right and everybody else, almost literally everybody else, uh, was wrong. Now, if we take the third strand, the neo-Nazi strand, uh, was also fairly classic in its Cold War orientation. This is a, an image of George Lincoln Rockwell, who was the originator of the American Nazi Party, which he then turned into the National Socialist People's Party. These sorts of organizations existed in many countries, although, of course, outlawed in Germany, existed in many countries uh, across the West and also in uh, Latin America during the Cold War period, trying to suggest that actually Nazism was right in particular ways, that they were the heirs to this, and that they were going to continue with this struggle. And one of the things that is perhaps most noticeable amongst the neo-Nazi groups, but also amongst all the other groups that I've talked about, the other two strands during the Cold War, is that the leader was all-powerful, but the leader would be contested. From time to time, there would be power struggles. These organizations did not have proper constitutions. They did not have open democratic fora. So when there was a power struggle, it was often a very difficult and bloody power struggle. Rockwell was assassinated, for example. A number of leaders were assassinated. One of the features, particularly of the neo-Nazi strand, but also of the other strands, was that these groups would fragment. There would be periods of time when for state security agencies, they would be of great concern. They would be worried about the possibilities of terrorism and other violence. But there was always a confidence that it would change because that group would fragment. It would change its form at some point over the medium term. So what I'm trying to suggest then is that the Cold War far right, in these three strands in the Western world, nationalist, Christian fundamentalist, and neo-Nazi, maintained very clear distinctions. They knew what it was they stood for, not in great ideological or intellectual depth, but in terms of labels. They knew what they stood for. They relied on clear leaders. But they were subject frequently to fragmentation. And one of the things that was particularly powerful in that fragmentation was this difference between those who wanted to stay pure and those who wanted, in some way, to compromise, to accommodate. So classically, some would want to have a political party, some would not. They would want to stay more hidden, more secret, more of a vanguard, more of a revolutionary group than a group that might accommodate to wider society in some sorts of ways. Because, of course, one of the key things for all of these groups is, and was, that mainstream society is that which threatens them. They are threatened by other sorts of groups, but fundamentally the problem is mainstream society. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a few minutes. So we enter then this period of globalization, not, of course, from one day to the next, but an era of globalization that's been emerging for, shall we say, at least 25 or 30 years. I think one of the things that we see in this emerging period of globalization is that these, these fixed identities have become much softer, much more fluid. Also, that people now have much, much more information, far, far more images, and in many parts of the world, more time 
with which to investigate these images and ideas and approaches. And so opportunities for individuals as individuals to reconstruct who they are, to decide that they have different views, ideas, and beliefs. Also, in the era of globalization, many people have said it was much better in the past before we had all this. The local had the answers. We had the answers here. We've lost some of those answers because things have become much more difficult and global. But the thing that, above all, has brought these sorts of changes about is the Internet, is the ability of the Internet to give people anything they think they might want to know or see or find out. And I think all of this, brought together, has led to a really profound change in the nature of the West's far right and arguably the far right more globally. Now, to give you some sense of this, I want to uh, introduce you fortunately only by PowerPoint, to two far-right individuals whose lives, I think, show, demonstrate some of these trends. And the first individual I'd like to share with you is a gentleman called Eli the Nazi, Eli Buanitov. Eli Buanitov is Jewish, he is Israeli, and he is a Nazi. Now, that is quite a strange combination. Jewish Nazi really is a very, very difficult combination to have. Given all that happened during the Holocaust, given the nature of the Israeli state, how can you be a Jewish Nazi? How can you be an Israeli Jewish Nazi? Well, Eli and his gang managed to find a way to be Nazis. They are all now happily in prison having committed various acts of violence on foreigners, gay people, but also on ultra-Orthodox Jews. They attacked synagogues. They uh, committed acts of violence, desecration. They were performing as they believed a Nazi gang would perform. It is true that he and many of his gang were second uh, and uh, sometimes third generation uh, immigrants of Jewish families from the former Soviet Union. But he had picked up these ideas and images of national socialism from the media, the internet media. It wasn't that the family back in Russia and Ukraine had been secret Nazis, not at all. Eli's grandmother spoke of the disaster that happened in her village when the Nazis came and killed enormous numbers of people. He discovered a new identity. He remade himself and his gang into national socialists. And these were things, these were ideas, these were practices and beliefs that structured their lives. Uh, they had uh, Nazi tattoos put onto their body. They had all sorts of pictures of themselves performing Nazi salutes and things of this sort. They were committed. And they communicated with each other by social media to tell the others just how right they were, just what it meant to the people to be a Nazi, just how they had to keep the faith, just how they had to keep going. And I don't know whether at the back you can see this um, very bottom quote. You probably can't, so let me read it to you. So one of the things he wrote is, Eli, this is, I won't have kids. My grandfather is half Yid, so this piece of trash right, doesn't have ancestors with even the smallest percent of Jewish blood. He would not have children because he knew that somehow he was, in his sense, impure, and he was not going to pass that impurity on. Now, some people might be thinking, there are some profound mental health challenges for these individuals. And often, what we do in these sorts of circumstances is we come across these sorts of examples, and we say, that is so bizarre, these people must have mental health problems. That is our answer to it. Well, of course, in some cases, it is true that there are people on the far right who do have serious mental health problems. But it is also clear that as a population, people who are part of the far right do not have more mental health problems than general populations. They have made decisions. They have been in particular company. They have seen particular images and they have acted accordingly. So that's, sorry, that's Eli. 
Let me introduce you now to Forrest Fogarty, American. Forrest Fogarty, leader for a time of the Confederate Hammerskins, which is a kind of neo-Nazi organization. Also, the lead singer of a hate music band. Hate music is incredibly important now to get the message across in far-right uh, organizations. He went through a number of neo-Nazi organizations, such as the National Alliance, but never really settled in one. He wanted to make his own identity. There wasn't one ready-made for him there. He joined the US military, and he served in Iraq. He found that his experiences in Iraq, he could interpret in ways to justify his hostility to other people here um, as he is speaking, his hostility to Arabs and Jews. The world is a very threatening place to Forrest Fogarty. The world is so threatening, all these different groupings are out to get him and his people. It is so threatening that he delights in the physical violence. He is here showing off scars that he has got in the street battles that he has fought against other groups or when he has just attacked individuals. He has to put his body on the line because in so doing, he is protecting his people. That is the theology, as it were, uh, that he believes in. One of the interesting last points about Forrest Fogarty is that he became a figure of great contention amongst his fellow Confederate Hammerskins. He sought to become the leader of the Confederate Hammerskins in Florida and a slightly wider region. Others did not want him to become the leader. How would they stop him? They didn't want to have a straight physical fight because that would seem to say that the Hammerskins were falling apart. So they used the internet. They used the internet to launch a smear campaign. They said that Forrest Fogarty was gay. Now, if you're a Hammerskin, you cannot be gay. They said that he was gay, but also they said that he was propositioning the wives and girlfriends of other Hammerskin members. He was a predator trying to secure his sexual preferences with these other women. They used very pornographic images on the internet, which were supposedly of him, all part of a campaign, not a very sophisticated campaign, but a very effective campaign, to say Forrest Fogarty is not what he appears to be. Social media, the internet, the knowledge that he'd gained from that, the way in which he'd use that to promote his brand of music, his hate music, had taken him up the ladder of authority amongst the Hammerskins. But it was also the means that pulled him down and prevented him from becoming a strong leader. Now, let me say something about what I think are the five important elements of understanding a far-right identity, certainly amongst the West and possibly uh, in a wider area of the world as well. The first is the importance of hate music. Second, merchandise. It's an era of globalization. Therefore, shopping is important. Even if you're a neo-Nazi, you want stuff. Stuff is good. Third, being real. Tattoos. Marking your body is a way of being real. Four, the power of physical presence. I've said a lot about the internet, and I will under five talk about online life, but actually human interaction is still significant and important. So let me say a little bit about, about each of these. First, through following music, bands and genres that are completely invisible to the musical mainstream, the far right is able to get its message across. Now, this is, I think, an incredibly important area. We need to understand it's an important area for at least three reasons. One reason is that a lot of these guys don't want to read. They don't want to read stuff. They don't want <coughs> pamphlets and books. They want to know, they want it given to them more easily. And music is a way of giving it easily. Second, it's not just the music, it's the visuals that go with it. So when you get hate speech of this sort, you also get artwork, you get little movies within their YouTube videos which show to people what the words are saying. Shows 
acts of hate, which of course can then be transmitted from wherever they're made around the world. Third, because actually music is at the very heart of many parts of Western far-right organizations. When these far-right organizations came into a new form at the end of the 1970s and the 1980s, maybe you could say when globalization began, it was music that led to structures, and music led to heroes. Now, one of the biggest heroes is a man called Ian Stewart, Ian Stewart Donaldson, who was a singer for a band called Screwdriver. When you see interviews or conduct interviews with people amongst vast swathes of the far right, particularly amongst formers, many of them will say, whether they be in Britain or Germany or Russia or America or Argentina or Australia, this man is a hero. It is convenient for them that this man was killed. He was killed in a road accident, but of course their belief is he was murdered. It is convenient because he can therefore not fall from grace. He has been put up there as a trust figure and a hero. And there are a number of individuals of this sort who through their performance have this status of trust. So these hate music approaches are ways of spreading ideas and beliefs and also ways visually showing how to behave. Second, commercialization. Stuff. You can buy stuff. All sorts of stuff. Um, I'm staying just over the road at the top end of Orchard Road, and you can't buy any of this stuff in Orchard Road. I'm very pleased to say that. But online, you can buy all this stuff. You can buy all sorts of things. You can buy badges. You can buy T-shirts. You can buy books and music and mugs and backpacks. Stuff. Stuff to show your brand, your brand loyalty. Actually, stuff you can buy because you're not sure if you really like the brand, but you're going to try that brand out for a little bit and see if it sticks, see if people think you're cool, see if it works. And if you don't, it certainly costs you a few dollars. You can dump it, get some other stuff. It's a way of trying out new identities, buying this stuff. It's a way also of showing your identity to an in-group of people who like things. It's also a way of challenging others, of course. If you have some sort of badge that demonstrates you have some sort of identity, it can be very, very threatening to others, and people may enjoy that feeling of power. You can buy German music, uh, that mug from Sweden. You can buy an American T-shirt, all online, all within 10 minutes, all sitting in your bedroom one night, and it'll all be delivered over the course of the next week. And if you like some of it and you don't like others, get some more. So commercialization allows people to try things out. Whereas once upon a time, you had to go and hear the leader, be accepted by the leader, or you had to read stuff. And people, people in the far right, they really don't want to read stuff. So the importance of music, the importance of commercialization. Um, some areas of commercialization haven't really kind of worked, though. One area that started 10 or so years ago was far-right hate computer games. Computer games where you could imagine yourself to be the skinhead or the Ku Klux Klan member, and you were destroying whoever it was you wanted to destroy. And of course, if you failed, you'd go back to the start, and you could play it again, and you could play it again. It was a way, again, a deliberate way of trying to communicate ideas, beliefs, and actions in a wider population. They don't do this now, though. This whole area has disappeared. And the main reason, probably, that it's disappeared is that the computer gaming industry now is so sophisticated, produces such extraordinarily advanced games, that there's no space. There's no space for these that were fairly crude in terms of their imagery, they were fairly crude in terms of emotion, they were very, very crude in terms of storyline, in the sense that there were not many directions in which you could go. It's a marketplace in which they have not been able to develop. The third area is, is what I described before about being real. How do these people do it? Because there's a sort of seamless connection between the belief and the action. If you believe that your people 
have their existence at threat, you should do something about it. Well, some people do things about it that are violent and get arrested. For others, it's a bit more difficult. So, tattoos have come in as a way of trying to show that you're real, as a way of trying to show that you're part of the hardcore of the group. The gentleman at the bottom there with the tattoos all over his face is quite an interesting individual. This is Brian Widner, who was the founder of uh, an organization called Vinlanders, a far-right, mostly online organization. He was part of the far right in North America for many years. And at around the age of 40, met another far right person, a woman, at one of their hate music concerts. They fell in love, they had a child, they wanted to have a child. Why? Because the white race is being exterminated, they believe, therefore, you need to have more white children. But when they had that child, they thought, we don't want to bring this child up in this way. This is actually a terrible way to live. It's a terrible way to live for a child. And so they've stepped away from the hate music and far-right world. This gentleman has had, I think, something like 23 operations now to remove the visuals on his face. They have joined anti-violent extremist groups and have seen this extraordinary thing of a child that was conceived because that child was going to be a soldier to a situation where having that child has transformed their lives. And what's interesting is this is not the only case where that has happened, where people on the far right have thought the child is important because it helps our cause, to the child has now transformed us in some sorts of ways. But the mainstream far right idea is that you really ought to mark yourself with your belief. Of course, part of it is a reaction against commercialization, because actually, you can throw the bag away after a couple of days. You can smash the mug. You can forget to wear the T-shirt. But if it's on your skin, it's on your skin. Then you are real. Then you really believe it. So you can find on the internet a huge amount of information about what sort of tattoos to have. Here, um, the one on the arm is for the hammer skins. Now, you can't, or at least it's very risky, just to go out and have a hammerskin tattoo put on, because if the hammerskins find you and you're not part of their gang, they're not going to say welcome. They're going to say, no, you shouldn't do this. So there are all sorts of rituals around, around how the tattoo works. And because the symbolism is so important, it has become something of great concern to a number of organizations, not least the militaries. The Italian military, for example, has become incredibly uh, concerned about this. Partly because discussions online about tattoos are very often linked to discussions about revolutionary violence. Lots of far-right organizations want their members to be in the military. They want their members to be trained by the military because, of course, they believe they are in some form of war. Therefore, they want to have military training. And there are elements of advice, and here is some, about how you can have a tattoo and, as it were, hide in normal, the normal world but still be real and still be preparing for that which comes subsequently. An extreme example is Mr. Curtis Algaier. Mr. Curtis Algaier is a uh, convicted murderer in the United States. You'll perhaps not be surprised to learn. And he has these markings all over his body and over his face. But of course, what's really important is that these are not random markings. These are meaningful markings, every one has a meaning to it. I, they are names of bands, they are symbols with particular meaning. It's actually very easy for us to say, oh, this is very, very crude, it's just the flag they have marked on them. It's not. There are a whole variety of ways of communicating through the marks that you put on your body. And of course, if you think again, that a number of people amongst this group are not the most well-educated, it is a very straightforward and easy way of having some way of communicating. Now, I think um, one of the things that we've had a lot of discussion about in terms of all sorts of radicalization is that it's the online world which has made the difference. The online world has transformed everything. And certainly that is true, but we must not ignore still the importance of physical meetings. In the Cold War days, those physical meetings may well have been held in meeting rooms with 
30, 40, 60, 80, 100 people in it, something large, something significant. Why? Partly because if you're going to organize it, something like that, it actually took quite a lot of effort. You couldn't communicate things very readily and easily, and now you can. Now you can text or Blackberry or you can tweet or whatever you want to do. Let's get together in two hours' time, in three hours' time, tomorrow morning. So it's enabled those, that physical presence to be more dynamic, to be smaller, more intimate in all sorts of ways. And in so doing, it's changed the nature of those physical meetings because they are now much more autonomous. It's much more those groups themselves in small numbers deciding to get together. They don't need a leader. They don't need to be called to do this. These groups now, therefore, because they can get together when they want to, they don't need to be called. They're not waiting for someone to tell them what to do. They don't need the leader. They don't need a center to organize them. They can organize themselves. Now, in the context of Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda-inspired terrorism, Mark Sageman has written of the leaderless jihad, where groups simply get themselves together and decide on particular operations. And that phenomenon is absolutely alive and well amongst the far right as well. An example of this is something called the Autonomous Nationalist Movement. Now, they call themselves nationalists, but they most certainly are neo-Nazis as well. Nationalists and neo-Nazis. They begin to blur things together. And that's something else I'll talk about in a few minutes. Here's an image of them, or at least a group of them. This is Runcorn and Stoke representatives. First point, you don't have to be London. You don't have to be from somewhere big. It's local, it's small. You don't get a smaller, more uh, unlikely place than Runcorn, should we say. Meet the York comrades. So let us assume one person is taking this picture. That makes five people. Runcorn, Stoke, and York, five people. <laughs> it's quite hard to imagine smaller groups than this. It's, it's, as I said on the previous slide, Roger Griffin talks about grouplets. They're not even a group. They're smaller than that. They're tiny entities that get together because they believe in something, and they can get together, and they can talk in particular sorts of ways. And so what we have seen as these small groups have emerged in different countries is that there is an important point to them getting together physically. But there is an important element also to the online. The online-offline distinction is fading away, if not has faded away. So yes, they're meeting and talking to each other, but they're getting ideas from the internet. They are autonomous, so they can decide which ideas to get from the internet. Once upon a time, if you were a member of a neo-Nazi organization such as the National Alliance, who were incredibly forward thinking in terms of using the internet, you went online, you learned what you had to do, where you had to go, what you had to think. Not now. You can shop around on the internet for ideas as well as for stuff. And that's what these kinds of organizations do. They are autonomous nationalists. What they do is basically commit to some denominator. They all share some core values. These groups that I've just shown you would share amongst themselves on the internet and when they meet in groups of five or fewer or more, certain things. These groups, for example, would share together white supremacy. That's definitely right. They would share, for example, Islamophobia. Muslims are out to get us. They would share that as a common denominator. Hostility to immigration, they would probably share as well. Probably that all politicians are out to destroy them. The politicians are also the enemy. Probably that most white people, in this case, because that's who they think they are coming from, most white people are blind to reality, that they are a vanguard. They're a kind of Marxist-Leninist vanguard in that sorts of sense, who can lead the revolutionary front, who can lead the people forward. And that will be it. They can express this in different ways. They can talk to different groups. Everything else above the line, as it were, can vary from group to group. So the physical is important, but it's interrelated with the online not distinct from the online. And so I say far-right life is lived online. 
all the information and stuff that they want, they can get online. And they can talk to each other online. The National Alliance, as I say, was one of the organizations that began this trend, but a lot of the others have uh, advanced it. And one of the crucial elements of the last few years for these sorts of organizations, as for so many others, is the shift from Web 1.0 to Web 2.0. In Web 1.0, you read. You were the receiver of information ideas. In Web 2.0, in the social media world, you are the co-creator of ideas. You are sharing, you are exploring, you are challenging, you are empowered. And that has become incredibly important, a profound transformation in the way in which these organizations and individuals operate. Conclusions. These far-right organizations are transforming. I want to go back to a point I made at the beginning, that they're not just another political party, or they're not just another organization. They're revolutionary. They want to overthrow society. That's their point. And they want to because they are filled full of dread. They dread that their people, whoever that might be, are facing extermination, annihilation, a genuine existential threat. And therefore, there is a duty upon them to behave in particular ways. There is duty for action. Formerly, as I say, these kind of organizations were fixed in nature, and now there is this wonderful word, plasticity. There's a growing plasticity. All sorts of different ideas can come across because people can make for themselves their own identities. These global identities are available. You can interpret them locally. You can take a little bit of it, some of it, all of it. That's up to you. And through social media, people now fashion on the far right their own ideologies, if you like. They can mix together a bit of nationalism, a bit of neo-Nazism. They can throw in a bit of Christian fundamentalism. That's become incredibly significant in the far right in the last six or seven years, as Islamophobia has grown and grown and grown. And we now have, as the ambassador was saying in his introduction, organizations that see themselves primarily as being there to defend against Islamification in Britain, in Australia, in Sweden, in Norway, people who genuinely believe that they are about to be annihilated by the Islamification of their country. And again, as the ambassador said in his introduction, a really good example of this is Anders Bering Breivik, who in Norway committed acts of utter brutality in killing people, set off his bomb in Oslo to distract the police, went to an island, Utøya, where young people from the left party were having a party conference. Really, it was a party. Took his guns, hunted them down, and shot them dead. A deliberate act. A deliberate planned act. And he wrote, he published his manifesto, if you like, 2083, a European Declaration of Independence, which is a really good example of this plasticity of taking different sets of ideas and mix them together for your own interests. There's a lot of nationalism in there. He talks a lot about nations. But he's also talking about Europe. I mean, some of the times he's talking about Europe, you would think he's a bureaucrat from the European Union or something. It's all oh, Europe must do this. We together must do that. So there's an interesting mixture in that sort of way. He talks about Christianity, his Christian roots, and how important that is. But then he talks about behaviors of his own and what he believes in that would not be acceptable in any church anywhere in the world. He has elements in there which are drawn very much from neo-Nazism. But then he also says elsewhere that if he could, he would go into a time machine and kill Hitler because Hitler was a disaster because he was anti-Semitic and the Jews are the strongest allies in this war against Islamification. Bringing sets of ideas together for his own purposes to make his own worldview, then acting on that worldview as a way, in his view, of inspiring others. So why is this important? Why is this interesting? Why is this focus on the global 
and globalizing far right significant? I think it's significant because there is such a tight connection here to violence. It's important because it speaks into the potentiality and the actuality of crime and of terrorist action. But also because perhaps it shows us some of the aspects of the dark side of the internet, the dark side of social media, some of the worries and concerns that people have expressed for some years about the nature of globalization and how it can play out in different places at different times. Thank you very much for listening.